Developing tomorrow's leaders. Educating, supporting, and inspiring the next generation of leaders. Your host, Antoine Thompson, or Coach T, has over 35 years of experience of empowering, motivating, and enhancing the lives of many young men and women. In this episode, Coach T speaks with Lori and Munzer, a world-class business results and mindset coach. She is also a two-time Olympian and Canada's first Olympic cycling gold medalist, which she won in 2004 while working full-time. Lori Ann is also the author of One Gear No Breaks. Thank you so much for joining me today, Lori Ann. Hey, awesome to be here, Antoine. No, I appreciate it. And that is uh, quite impressive. And, and I think for me, the thing that stood out the most is for you to train and to win a gold medal while working full time. I think it sends a huge message that you can accomplish anything that you set your mind to. Would you agree with that? I would totally agree 100 percent. And I think the real thing that makes a difference is and this is a question I always ask everybody. Are you in love with your goal? Are you in love with your goal? Are you like all in? I know for me, I am 110 percent or more um, sold on what I love doing. And it's all about not so much helping kids be the best versions of themselves, but I think it's also the process of learning to be a better, better mentor for them as well. So I think that's a part of being all in is when you're always looking to be better and not just like for your, like just, just use you for example, if you knew you could go for two more gold medals, I know you do it without even blinking an eye. True. Absolutely. Yeah, no exactly. Hesitation. So, no hesitation. No hesitation. Yeah, no, <laughs> trust me. I totally understand that. And I think the, the one thing I, I want to talk about it, and, and I want to keep bringing up your accomplishments because I think it's important as we talk to kids about achieving um, success is first and foremost, you have to have goals in order to achieve success. You just can't go out and just chase one thing after another. And then whatever you're successful, is, you just assume that you've reached some uh, pinnacle in your life. Um, what were goals that you set for yourself in this quest to achieve this gold medal? I only had one, and that was one. to win an Olympic gold medal. I had no idea that gold had never been won before. I I had thought so many other cyclists before me had already done it, but no, you only need one goal. And it's a goal that is so big that it scares and excites you at the same time. And the reason that you do both is because then you truly have focus because there's a number of things that will lead all the way up to the big goal. There's multiple steps always, but there is only one goal. There is only one goal. Interesting. That's an interesting approach because I know from my perspective, you know, it's always been if you overwhelm yourself and I, I use this with uh, the teens that I work with, if they overwhelm themselves with the big goal, but they're developing unlike adults, you know, they're they're growing and learning about themselves as they go along. But I think uh, your point is well taken is if you know what ultimately what you want to have, that's what you keep your eye on the prize, if you will. And I think that's what you were just describing, yeah. keeping your eye on the prize and chasing your ultimate goal, which is you know the success that you achieved. Um, exactly. But there's, there's one part I'm going to interject here is a goal is a progressive realization towards success right? It's number of components that you have. So it's not like the first year I said, oh, I'm going to go win a gold medal. Well, I did, but it didn't happen. So you break it into different milestones and those milestones are seasons, they're years, right? So the first year I did my Olympics in Sydney, Australia in 2000, and my event lasted 36 seconds where I said, I want to do this again, but I want to win gold. So over the next four years, it was a science, it was a plan, and it was a beautiful progression of just like a plane taking off. A plane isn't a rocket. We can do that. But we also know that when the rocket comes down, it comes down really hard and, and we don't want to do that. So you have a building plan. You can shorten your performance like in school, on the field, off the field. But you have to have that plan. 
for kids setting goals, you know, and mm -hmm. setting it and being successful in school. You know, there's so many different components that come into play. It's not just the academics. It's the social interaction. It's the athletic interaction. It's the extracurricular clubs and things of that nature. And then you couple that with trying to be successful at home, you know, with your relationship with your parents and with your family and things of that nature. There's a lot of stress. What a, a couple, of, if you can just share kind of a couple of things that you outline as maybe like foundations for being successful and, and not being overwhelmed by all those different components. Yeah, that's a really good component question. There's a number of things that we all have going on in our life. And I think, well, I don't think I know when we have a picture in certain areas that we want to do really well with, that's when we thrive. If we don't have a picture, that's when we're not growing. We're not being able to apply ourselves as much as we want to. So number one, get a picture. And you may have three, four, or five pictures. You may have, you know, a scholastic, a school picture. Hey, I want to, um, you know, finish 70, 80% in the class, right? That's going to take a little bit of reviewing consistently every day. So the picture is, you know, sitting down at a desk, having your books open and understanding the material so you can apply it. So you could teach it to somebody else. Um, if it's a sports, you know, goal there is, do you want to finish like everybody, your whole team is on the podium or are you just standing as an individual on the podium? Because there's individual sports, there's team sports. Um, maybe there's two or three of you on a team and it could be just that being on the podium at home. How do we want to function, right? How do we want to thrive? Are we, you know, fisticus with our brothers and sisters or are we all helping each other and saying hey you can do this what do you need help with right because we all know something and we're all able to apply something can we do all of it probably not but there's always people around us that they they've got something really special about them and when you have a picture of what you want to do you're you're halfway there when that picture is clear then it's just a matter of, well, if I know one step to get there, that's all you need. You don't have to have 10 all pre-planned because I can tell you it's going to change and it's not going to happen the way that you think. You take the first step and you move towards it. You see a little bit more. Another step falls in. You get another idea and you go, oh, I know who I have to talk to. I know who I have to call. Um, I know who I could get and bring together. And, you know, we would be so powerful as a collective that it would be just, we would shock ourselves and we would probably shock everybody else with the results that they would see us accomplishing. So the picture is number one. And then if you've got say three areas like that, family, school, maybe sports, even arts, you can swap out arts for sports, right? Something that you love to do is ask yourself, am I spending a little bit of time in each area every day? Sometimes there'll be a little bit more, sometimes there'll be a little less, and that's okay. But as long as you're touching those areas consistently in a little bit, you're going to notice a huge change over three days, over six days, over nine days, over a month, over two months. And I guarantee you that you're, you're going to see a pattern there that will, will take you to where you want to go. And if you're not getting there, you're going to be able to ask for help. You're going to see where do I need a little bit of help? Where can I reach out and say, hey, hey, is there anybody out there that, you know, is experiencing the same thing or, or something close to what I'm doing? There are a couple things in there that I really liked a lot. Of, and then the latter part of what you mentioned is in each one of the areas, the aforementioned areas, you know, allocating time for each and not putting everything, all your eggs in one basket, if you will. You know, so let's just say if it's the academics and you don't put as much in sports and you put all your focus in the academics, sure, you're going to do great there, but then you may fall a little behind or not be where you want to be. But if you're putting a little bit of time into everything every day, then you're going to gradually get better at everything every day. So I, I really like that part. The other part is you alluded to was about connecting with other people that can help you achieve those goals as well. I think a lot of kids 
also take a lot of the burden on themselves and feel like they have to do everything themselves and they can't reach out to either a coach or a parent or a teacher or another administrator to help them. And I think it's really important for them to understand that nobody achieves anything by themselves. Um, it, there's always other people that are influential in their lives that can help them. And sometimes it's even just having somebody to bounce something off of. It's not so much to give them all the answers, but sometimes you just need to ask questions so you can get answers to, to number one, assure you're on the right path. And number two, just to support you. Totally. There's a really good, um, I believe it's an African saying. It says, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. But if you want to go far, take others with you. And I think that's real key because you can do a bit of both. You can be fast, but you can also take others with you. You can go as a group. And sometimes it just takes one person to start, which is leading. And everybody is actually a born leader. Just not everybody feels that they have a voice. And when we have a voice, when we try things, we have that word that starts with be, believe. When we start to believe that we can do it. The posture starts to change, especially with our kids and youth, right? It's just like, oh, right. maybe I could do this again. And you do it once and you know what that feeling is. And it's just, where can you take it? Can you repeat it again? And can you repeat it, you know, in your sports, in home, um, scholastically, you know, maybe some of the older kids, they're working maybe a little bit here and there, a couple hours, or maybe they're volunteering. And you just, you can really thrive and grow when you feel it. But that belief actually starts within. And it's it's actually contagious. That's the best part. Uh, 100% it is contagious. And as you're describing that, it reminded me of our summer league that we have every year from a nonprofit. And uh, one of the things I experimented with the first year was having high school students coach the middle school students during the summer league. And one of the things oh, that was so great brilliant. about it. Yeah, it was um, it far exceeded my expectations to watch and to your point about everybody's a born leader. But sometimes you don't know what type of leader you are until you're put in that leadership position and you get to showcase your leadership skills. And to watch these young men and women coach these fifth and sixth and seventh graders with so much passion, so much conviction, so much enthusiasm. And then to, to see the kids feed off of that enthusiasm, those are the kind of uh, environment, that's the type of environment that I think a lot of kids need to experiment with or just have the opportunity to be a part of so that they can see. And then the next year I had more kids ask if they could coach because they had so much fun doing it. they were telling other kids they're like oh i want to want to do it so i had more kids than i needed so we started pairing them up so that everybody could have an opportunity to do it and it's, it was just a great opportunity to watch kids take over take ownership of being leaders yeah and that's a perfect segue like brilliant idea you know have the high school students you know coach and, and mentor i think you said the middle school so yes. the younger generation coming up is like, oh, like what a skill set both groups are getting, right? As leaders, the high school students, and then emerging leaders, the younger students coming up. It's, right. That is incredibly powerful. But there's another component that I think is really interesting, too, and just what the high school kids share with me. They started going, oh, now I know what my coach expects from me because now I'm in a position that my coach is in and when I'm trying to get, when they're trying to get me to accomplish certain things and I'm not getting it. Now I understand what their frustrations are sometimes, or I understand when they say certain things, what they mean. Yeah, totally. And we learn all a little differently. So really interesting. You know, we have um, athletes, students that are more kinesthetic, so hands-on. We have those that are incredibly visual and then those that, you know, you say it once and they've got it. And, and others, sometimes it's like you say it a hundred times and it's like, how is that not going in? And when the roles are switched around, you get a totally different perspective. And the other thing is, as a coach, you you really get to see how many ways you can explain the same concept 
five times, five different ways, three different ways, or sometimes maybe there's only a couple of ways to explain it. But you see when, you know, the, the kids get it and they just, they just light up and they're like, okay, now I know what it is. And part of that comes from, they have a picture, which was right at the start is when we have a picture, we can go out and do so many things and, and do them so much better. There was a, a young lady about four years ago, high school basketball, but this girl's a phenomenal player. And I'm training her. We're doing a uh, one-on-one lesson. And I started, we we're talking about um, some ways of her creating scoring opportunities for herself. And I explained something to her. And we had been working on this for probably about two weeks or so. But I come up with a new way of, of, of explaining it to her. And after I explained this one particular way, she stopped and looked at me and said, why didn't you just tell me that the first day I would have gotten it? And <sighs> what I got, what, what I learned from my life, you know, we both laughed about it, but it, it was a kind of an eye opener for me as a coach was, again, going back to we get better at co as coaches with every uh, client or, or student that you work with, because everybody learns different to your point. And she is one of those very direct and what I was doing was trying to, you know, build, do the building block thing. And when I got ultimately got to the, the pinnacle of it, she's like, you just told me that I would have gotten it. But that's the type of player she was. Her basketball IQ is really high. She really understood what we're trying to accomplish. But it was a great opportunity for me to know, you know, sometimes you have to go through the steps. And then sometimes you can be very direct to figure out what it is that they do know. Totally. Totally. And I mean, everybody's learning style is so different. And that's the power of getting to know people, get to spend time with them, because we can make assumptions, which sometimes they can be pretty funny, right? We assume, you know, the, the young people will, will understand and they don't because they haven't necessarily had that experience. But the more we know about ourselves as a coach, the more that we can help our students, our up and coming athletes and just get everybody to really gel and, and work together even better. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the yeah. one thing I, I, I definitely wanted to ask you about in re, as regards to your coaching, too, and as well as myself, how much um, and how do you approach or first question is, on a scale of one to 10, how important is the word relationship to you and your coaching? And number two, uh, what is your approach to um, building that relationship with your clients and understanding and helping them achieve their goals? Absolutely. Yeah, that one is 10 out of 10. It's really important because if you don't have a relationship, um, what's going on? Why are we working together? Uh, what are we doing? So I think really life is about relationships. It's building experiences. It's building relationships together. So it's part and parcel. And then your second question was about the. The, the process by which you do. The, yeah. The process by which you build a relationship with your clients. Right. I think number one is, is understanding what do they want to achieve? What are they looking for? Um, everybody brings something amazing and different to the table, but when you're specific about what you want to do, then the way the doors open up. So if you're vague, it's going to be really hard. So really spending time on the goal and finding out what does, you know, my client want, what does the athlete want? Cause I work with both athletes. I work with business leaders, helping them bridge the gap from where they are to where they want to be. And when you're crystal clear on that, there's so many things that you'll find will instantly start to fall into place, but then that's where the work begins. The hardest part is to figure out what are you passionate about? Why do you want to do what you're telling me you want to do? And then number three is what's getting in the way. That's always where I start because we all have a block. We all have a barrier. There's something that is stopping us. Maybe it's fear of success. It's, it's not usually fear of failure because we all fail multiple times a day. We still do. It doesn't matter how young, how old we are, but not everybody gets to experience success. 
And sometimes that is more of an unknown, or we feel we have to have more time, or we need more money, or I don't have the right people, or I don't have enough people, whether it's the team sports on the field or in the office. So there's a couple really good key components there, I think, that make up what I would call the foundation. Because when you have a good foundation, you can build a castle. You can literally build a castle on top of it. But if your foundation is not solid, that's where you'll run into problems is what I've learned and seen in my time as an athlete and also as a business mindset coach. Now, I asked you that question because I already knew, you know, I knew what you were going to say, but the reason I wanted you to, to share it is because the importance of uh, our listeners understanding from my perspective as a youth coach and a development coach, and then you as a business and athlete coach, that relationships are the foundation to everything. And I think a lot of people sometimes chase things back to, uh, I believe the quote you were talking about, the African saying, if you can go really fast by yourself. But when you're working with other people, one of the things is the relationship building is a process. And to your point, you were mentioning you have to get to what's holding people back. Well, you typically don't get to what's holding people back until you're able to build a, enough of a rapport and relationship with them to build, number one, trust in you as a coach so that you can start to tap into hey let's start now we're starting to get somewhere now we've kind of kind of cracked the ice we haven't broken it but we've cracked the ice a little bit getting a little closer to what's holding you back from achieving what you what you want to achieve and then secondly not only once we achieve that together by building a relationship now we probably can exceed your expectations because we built such a good relationship and such a good bond and then now the sky's the limit and it's all because you trusted in somebody and you took the time to allow them to build a relationship with you to help you be successful. Exactly. And, and that word trust there is it's everything, because when you have trust, there are so many possibilities that you can can move into. Um, if there isn't the trust, there's always that feeling, well, there's there's a wall between us there, or there's something in the way. And the doors and the floodgates literally begin to open because there's there's a calmness, there's an ease. And it's just I, I also think it's a respect back and forth because, yes, the coach may be up here. If the, if you're looking at a hierarchical, a hierarchical uh, way of it and, you know, as a player, you're down here or as a um a coachy, I guess you could say, but really we're we're all the same. It's just can you take your knowledge, impart it on somebody else so that they can understand and go out and do something they have never done before? That's what coaching and mentorship is. There's a time, I believe, to tell people what they need to do, but then there's also the responsibility as an athlete and also an emerging leader of you have to decide too, because the coach may not always be there. So if the coach isn't there, do you understand what you need to do? Can you do it? And have you thought of a couple different scenarios? Cause there's always one picture you have that works really good. And then something comes, you know, maybe a, a mechanical or, I don't know, you know, just the business deal falls through. So have you thought how you're going to counter that? I call it obstacle versus an incident because it's just a challenge. And then can you even counter that counter one more time? So you're really playing just at multiple levels. And it's actually a lot of athletes, I don't think, think. They just go on automatic pilot. They do what they're told to do. And there isn't any thinking. And when we start to think, then, wow, you've taken responsibility and you can just elevate your game and your results to a whole new level. No, I like that very much. And I think the other part, when you were talking about uh, the trust thing, I think another component that really mm -hmm. comes into play a lot, too, that holds people back sometimes and uh, especially when they're working with uh, with athletes, with a coach like myself or businesses working with an individual like yourself is they're afraid of being judged because of where they are. Um, and you, we're talking about the fear of not fear of failure, but, you know, it's the fear of success. 
and I think this being non-judgmental is really important too. That helps to lay a good foundation for a relationship because sometimes people don't want to share because they're afraid that you're going to judge them because they either haven't done something or they're afraid to do something. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree. And we, we see that all the time. It's everywhere. And, you know, again, it comes back to the belief. Do you believe you can do this? Because it's either you believe you can do it or you don't. And if you're not sure, well, then what, do you need to do to believe that you can do it? I think when people come to you or, you know, when I've worked with, with uh, kids, I think it's, they're looking for that affirmation that, yeah, you can do that. And then it's just a matter of once we say, yeah, you, yeah, we can, we can make that happen for you. And then they're like, Oh, oh we can. Okay. Well, <laughs> how, do, how, how, how do we do that? Well, let's start talking about how we can make that happen. But I think that, that I know from my experience, that's been one of the, one of the first hurdles that I get over with kids is when, you know, they doubt themselves. And when you reassure them, like, Hey, you know, I see that you're doubting yourself, but I see something that you don't see. And what I see is that you can very easily accomplish this particular goal. And then when they do, I think you referenced it earlier, when their eyes get big, like, Oh my gosh, I can do this. Well, if I can do this, that means I probably can do X, Y, and Z. And, that's yep. where we as coaches come in as um, as literally as cheerleaders as well as coaches. I think that's a big part of coaching, too, is being that cheerleader to, you know, really keep pushing people in the right direction once they do believe that they can accomplish goals. True. Absolutely. It's funny when you were talking about uh, the belief and and yeah, we can or you can. I was thinking the title of my book that was published back in 06 is called One Gear, No Brakes. So that was a play on my bicycle. Most people at the Olympics uh, didn't know that my bicycle had only one gear and no brakes. And her average speed was 40 miles an hour, 45, maybe 50, uh, 50 miles an hour tops, which is pretty smoking fast. But the, the secondary title of my book is called Belief, Belonging, and a Gold Medal. And I think when we're part of a team, we have that belonging. We have that feeling that we are part of something greater, of something bigger. And the second part that comes to it, and I think to a lot of athletes, is the belief, the believing part that they can do it. And when we're in that habit of thinking of ways we can do, you know, maybe a, a quicker drill or a better performance or a better game, because everybody is literally, you know, on their best game ever or their best day ever, that's when, you know, the gold medal at the Olympics that was the result, but that wasn't what it was all about. It was about the journey that led up to it. So it's sort of like the law of cause and effect. The effect is the result, so the gold medal. And the cause is the only thing that we have to take care of. It's it's your action. And if you take one step every day, consistently consistent, and even a rest day in training can be considered part of training because we do need a rest day. If you think more, 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 it's not always better. It's actually, it'll take away from your performance. So when you have a plan and you believe that the plan is going to work, sometimes we have to tweak and adjust it along the way, but it's, it's that recipe towards that goal and that result of what it is that you you know, have the picture, that visualization in your mind. So it's taking it out of your head, your mind, and bringing it into, you know, physical reality where others can see it, you can see it, they feel it, you feel it. You're riding 40, 50 miles an hour with no brakes? That's correct, sir. Why does your bike not have brakes? Well, it's the old traditional bicycle. So before we had gears, there was only one gear on the bicycle. And if we're going to back up one more step, it's called a penny farthing. So it had a really large front wheel and a very small wheel. It kind of had to climb on top of it to get it going. So if you think about the tricycle, you put your feet on the pedal, you turn the pedal, the faster the wheels turn. If you want to slow down, then you contract your quadriceps, your thighs, and your hamstrings, it applies pressure and you slowly slow down. Well, 
when they put two wheels that were the same size together, they ran it from where the pedals are, the cranks to the rear of the bike. And nobody at that point had invented a brake. So it was just the handlebars, the frame, two wheels, um, your pedals and a chain and of course a bike seat. So that was it. It, it is the most basic <laughs> that you can get. So you could sort of think of it, a track bike is like a tricycle, but the adult version, and there's only two wheels. There's not three. Yeah. That, I never knew that to, you know, and then I didn't even put two and two together and thought about your title of your book, One Gear, No Brakes. I'm thinking, okay, it's got to be something, no brakes and achieving your goal is how I interpreted that when I was reading that. Well, That's what was. I was thinking. It was a play on words. So the title yeah. of the book is B-R-E-A-K-S. So the breaks you get in life, the breaks you get in sports or the breaks right. you don't. But my bicycle was the yeah. B-R-A-K-S. So yeah. Like the only way you can stop is either to crash, which is never a good one, um, or take an extra lap, contract your muscles, power force them and slowly slow down your leg speed. That's still, that's even more impressive now that you explain it like that and you went to go metal riding a bike with no brakes. Now, that, I think that's what it, that's what it's going to be hard for me to get over. Um, I'm going to throw one I, more, one more thing in for you. So yeah. My bike that. has one here, no brakes. We ride on an oval. Typically, it's a wooden track and the track can be banked in the corners about 45 degrees. So it's not mm. flat. It's not, not flat, flat at all. Yeah. Well, you are definitely a risk taker, Lorianne. That I will give you because you couldn't pay me <laughs> enough to do that because I think my eyes would get big. Forget about taking an extra lap. I might have to take four or five just to gradually slow down. But that's still that's yeah. even more impressive now to explain it like that. But no, I actually <laughs> wanted to talk about your riding experience, too, before we go to is. What, where did your love of riding come from initially? <laughs> well, my grandfather was always putting together bicycles in his uh, retirement. So he had, in the basement, my sister and I would go down and there'd be a whole wall of various size of bikes, little ones to 10 speed and adult size ones. So my grandpa, he had the adult bikes, you know, all taken care of. He could test ride and make sure they were good, but the little bikes, well, that was up for my sister and I to uh, test ride and let them know that everything was working good. And I don't know. It's just, I think it's built in me. I love chasing things, buses, cars, motorcycles, other people on bicycles. And it was just, it became a game of how fast could I go? Then it was how far could I go? And then could I put both of them together? And then I decided, you know what, this was so much fun. I decided after four weeks of riding, I was going to join a bike club. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So I was the only girl with 10 guys, all ages, and most of them wanted to be on the national team. None of us were on the national team. We did our first race within the first four weeks, and I won that race. So I was definitely hooked for life. And then it was uh, an 18-year journey of some trials, tribulations, ups and downs. I went from road racing, uh, which most people are typically, they know about. And then I got into track racing. I had met the track national coach for Canada, Des Dickey. And he said, you know what, you've got great results on the flats for criterium racing. And I'd love you to come and try out and join the national team. So I did, I had no idea what I'd gotten myself into. Even I didn't even know that the bike had one gear and no brakes. I had no clue. And I had no idea we were like riding on a 45 degree bank track at the same time with about 50 of our closest friends. So it was, it was crazy. The first year I was, I was literally in over my head and, and well, sometimes that, you know, is the way we typically go as kids or big kids you jump in and then you figure it out. Now you say you were uh, in over your head, but were you discouraged at any point or was it just one of those things where you just had to take a step back and go, okay, this is an adjustment and I can do this or I don't know. <laughs> it was a bit of both. Um, typically I, I jump in full tilt. Um, I ask better questions. Now I ask more questions now. Um, Usually I'm just so excited. It's just, you go full in. 
Um, you get the equipment. There was also the financial. There was the traveling. I was working full time. So then I had to bring the training up. Um, went abroad to Europe. I was in uh, Europe. We went to Australia. I've been in the United States. I've been in South America. I've been on every continent and raced on every continent except Africa. So pretty cool history, pretty good career. And just you, you learn things really quick and you learn them quicker if you don't ask a lot of questions. Good so, question. you know, if, if there's any athletes up and coming, ask the questions. You can never ask enough questions and then go out, try it, see what works, think about it. And then, you know, figure out, keep all the good stuff that works and know what doesn't. That's great advice. That is great advice. Um, that's really impressive, Lorian, that, that uh, what you've accomplished, but also more importantly, I think it's what you put yourself through to achieve it. I mean, I think being on uh, so many different continents and working full time and learning, um, I guess you could say new methods of cycling, if you will, from the road racing to the track racing. Uh, I think a lot of people sometimes are afraid to step outside the norm or or to cross the lines and to go to that uh un, go into uncharted waters if you will um i know from um experiences that i've been through things like that where you kind of like uh, i don't know but then like you say you just go to it and, and you and you figure it out or you ask questions and i i probably was more like you didn't ask questions kind of learned as i went along but most appreciative of what i accomplished because of the, the ebbs and flows and the highs and lows of the process which is what makes us better as well and you know with what we do we're getting kind of really understand it a little bit more uh, so a couple of questions for you before we go um number one uh, would you like to share with us what you're working on currently um in your oh. business yeah, for sure. I work with a lot of leaders and emerging leaders in all and various different areas of business. So I've got some entrepreneurs, uh, some medical companies, some financials, some salespeople. And we look at it from a mindset coaching. That's my specialty. So uh, to sum it up, I teach people how to think and achieve their goals like an Olympic athlete, but in the boardroom. So we get the leaders to identify what their goals are and figure out where it is that we want, they want to go. And then I give them the tools to close that gap. We call it a knowing doing gap. And we literally just, you know, figure out what's getting in your way and what's going on. And it's really exciting to see just the changes and the growth that they go through. You know, one of my clients, he uh, closed, seven figures in four months. He's taken his company global. Uh, another couple leaders have double and tripled their teams. A couple have also like taken their gross annual revenue and 10 x it. So there's some that are just actually starting out. So they've broken away from traditional corporate and they started their own company. So really like what kind of mindset do you need? And it's, it's the same as being an athlete, except it's being in a boardroom, right? You're still building those relationships. You still have to have those plans. You're executing all the daily, and I call it goal achieving actions. So, you know, as an athlete, it's more obvious of going, okay, well, we maybe need to get in the gym. We need to do some stretching. We need to do some field playing. In the boardroom, that type of uh, training is actually really sticking to the plan. If you only did two or three things that would move you closer to your business goals, what are those activities? And there's always a staple every day, Monday to Friday or seven days a week that you and your team are always executing. So we, I really help them get clear on what they want to do, where they're going, and then also building a really good team so that they can go far and be self-sustaining. That's impressive. Man, seven figures in how many months? You said seven figures in how many months? Four? Four months. Wow. That's the goal impressive. was three. The goal was three. And it actually took him uh, three months and 28 days. Ah, so actually less than four. That's good. Still, I mean, a little bit, yeah. but 
that's impressive. So yeah, it's obviously that you're working and uh, your website is lorianmunzer.com and that's Lori, L-O-R-I hyphen A-N-N Munzer, M-U-E-N-Z-E-R.com. And your email address is lmunzer at lorianmunzer.com. Correct? Absolutely. You bet. Thank you. Got all that. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. And my final question for you is if you could share with us the individual or individuals that have been most influential in your life and why. Oh, my goodness. I would probably have to say my grandma was the most influential person. I think she was probably the most patient with me because you know, when you have a lot of energy, not a lot of people know what to do with you or what to do with that energy. And you know what? My grandma was, she was a real hard nut in terms of you did things in a certain way. You didn't deviate from, from them. So you always knew, you know, what the rules were. And when it was time to play, it was go full tilt, go and play full tilt. And then grandpa on the other end, I think he was the one that, you know, fueled me with the love for cycles, bicycles. And, you know, it's like I said to my grandma after I did my first Olympics, what do you think grandpa would say? Because he used to take a wrench and a screwdriver to the bicycles that he worked on. And the bicycles that I race on, well, it's, you know, they're titanium, they're carbon fiber, and you work with very specific tools and nothing like I'd ever seen on my grandfather's desk or, or bench. And it was just grandma said, I don't know, but I'm I'm sure he'd be really, really proud. So yeah, those would be the yeah. two probably most influential people. Total patience. We did things in a certain way. We also traveled together and it was just that real core group of who I was really connected with and who meant a lot to me. I like that a lot. Um, I'm always uh, partial to people that, uh, Point out uh, family members, and although there's no right or wrong answer for me, it's uh, two reasons. One, I I'm curious. Number two, it's to let our listeners know that you know there's always different people in our lives. It's not always family. Sometimes it's people that have influenced us in in work life or sports or whatever it might be, or a coach or something like that. But everybody's inspired by uh, different people in our lives. And as soon as I asked you the question, I could see you light up and, uh, and when you mentioned him. So I think you knew right off the bat, which I think it's even, even makes it even more special. And also to the connection that they had with your cycling as well. I think that that's a big part of it too. And that being a big part of your life. So I really appreciate you sharing that with us. It is. I'm also going to share just one other thing really quick is I also sure. had a few instrumental teachers you know, in high school. And I can think of one lady in particular, she's gone now. Um, she was my business teacher. So we did accounting, we did office practice. There was also another lady that, uh, you know, typing 101 when we used to take that way back when she was instrumental. And you'll always find that there's always one or two people that you gravitate towards. And sometimes you can't explain it. It's just this feeling that comes from inside. And they'll usually tell you, go for it. Or they'll say, that's not impossible. You just haven't figured out the way. And sometimes that's all that you need is just to know that you've got one person in your court or one person that says, go for it. I know you can do it and you'll figure out a way. So, you know, if you're ever wondering any of the kids out there that are, are listening is just go find that one person. You don't have to tell everybody what you're doing. But just that one or two that's really close, like keep them close right to your heart. And I guarantee you will figure it out. You will find your way and you'll find your voice. Well, you actually just provided what I was going to ask you next. If you had any parting words of encouragement <laughs> and that was spot on. And I really appreciate you sharing that because that is so true. Um, just finding that person that believes in you and that will support you 100 percent of the time, because uh, some many times that's all a lot of young people need is knowing that there's that one person that believes in them and, and they know that they can share with and confide in. So, well, Lorianne, this has been an absolutely uh, a joy to have this conversation with you. And I really appreciate you taking the time, sharing your expertise um, and also um, your journey as a gold medalist, which I think is really great. And I, I pretty, really am honored to have you on. Uh, it's not very often that many people, podcast hosts can say that they had Olympic, Olympic champions on, but I, I can brag about it. Now. <laughs> 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 
check that. I can check that off my list now. Uh, Olympic <laughs> champion. I've had uh, Guinness World Book of Records holders on here. I've had a national championship coach, and ooh, yeah, I'm I'm actually racking up some stuff here. I gotta actually put this on a little spreadsheet or something. I'm actually getting some big time guests on here. Huh? <laughs> what do you think? That's awesome. You know what? This has been a real honor and a pleasure to to share time and a conversation with you here. So thank you. Thank you for oh. sharing the time. Oh, my absolute pleasure, Lorianne. I really appreciate it. And I, I know that you and I will stay connected and I uh, wish you all nothing but the best. Awesome. Well, this has been great. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. All right. Thank you. I'm Coach Tien. As always, I'm here to educate, support, and inspire the next generation of leaders. Until next episode, take care. Coach T's Sea of Success Academy is an educational platform that focuses on providing teens with the necessary skills and tools to be successful in their academic, personal, and professional lives. His curriculum is designed to help children develop a growth mindset, which is crucial to achieve any goal they set for themselves. The courses are based on the universal design for learning approach, with courses available in video, audio, and ebook formats. Visit CoachTeesCorner.com to find out how to ensure a path of success for your children.